Hello and welcome uh, to our regional briefing on best practices for gender equality in conventional arms control. This is part of a series of briefings to regional groups that UNIDIR has been doing. And today we are pleased to have a briefing with the Eastern European group. Uh, I'm Renata Dallacqua. I work at UNIDIR, the UN Institute for Disarmament Research, where I lead the Gender and Disarmament Program. Uh, today, our meeting is also being recorded. It will be uploaded to the UNIDIR YouTube channel, and we can share with um, member states, but also civil society and stakeholders uh, working in the region on issues related to um, arms control and disarmament. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I know everyone is super busy lately and I am very grateful that you have taken the time. And I think it's precious time. It's maybe your lunch break to be here with you, with us. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so very special thanks from our side. I think this, this final months of the year are, are especially crowded with meetings and we really appreciate um, you joining us. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, I would like to just share an overview of the agenda for us today. We'll start with opening remarks from Ambassador Leshi of Albania. Uh, then we will move into a presentation which will be delivered by myself, my colleague Hannah Salama and my colleague Erica Mumford. We're going to focus on taking stock and identifying areas for further action in um, the fields of mine action and the field of weapons and ammunition management, just because um, we think these are important uh, areas of arms control and disarmament where progress has already been made, but also where uh, there are more opportunities for bringing gender perspectives into, into consideration. But in, additionally, in addition, is also because we have upcoming meetings um, on these issues. Here in Geneva in November, um, the meeting of the uh, parties to the CCW will take place. And the CCW we know has an AP2 which discusses IEDs. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to touch base on how to bring gender perspectives into that discussion. And also the APMBC, the Anti-Personal Landmine Ban Convention, will also meet in Geneva in November. And that has a, 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 also presents us with opportunities to discuss issues related to gender mainstreaming. Additionally, uh, there is another uh, multilateral process occurring, which is the OEWG on conventional ammunition. And they are meeting early next year. So we thought, again, this would be an opportunity for already start thinking, you know, what could be done in that forum. So after our presentation, we'll have some time for a Q&A where we would like to hear from you. Um, questions, comments, suggestions, sharing national perspectives or regional perspectives. Um, we are certain that you have a lot to, to add and contribute to this body of work. And to conclude, we will have Cecil Aptel, the Deputy Director of UNIDIR. So this is just, you know, a quick um, overview of the agenda. Uh, if possible, I would like to kindly ask you to keep your camera open. So this uh, helps with the interactive element of this meeting. But also please mute yourself when you're not speaking. That also helps, you know, for, for, for us to be able to, to hear each other. Please feel free to use the chat at any time. We'll be paying attention to the chat. Um, now, uh, allow me to introduce our opening speaker, which is, uh, we're very, very happy to have her here with us today, Ambassador Leshi. Uh, she is the permanent representative of Albania to the UN in Geneva. Uh, and we know Albania attaches high importance to issues of gender equality. So we're very much thank you, thankful for Albania's leadership in this area as well. And Ambassador Leshi, she has a lot of experience in multilateral affairs. Um, she was posted uh, at the OSCE, representing Albania and the OSCE. And I understand also in capital, she was also dealing with issues related to international organizations. And she has uh, extensive experience here in Geneva as well. We are um, looking forward to, to her remarks. Ambassador, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Renata. Thank you for the invitation because it was an excellent opportunity for me to look a bit more closely at what UNIDIR has been doing, but also reflect a little of what Albania has been doing regarding arms control. And as you already mentioned, gender equality and women's empowerment are high on the priorities of the Albanian government. We have been very active in promoting gender equality. 13 out of the 16 ministers in our government are women. And some of the highest public offices, including Parliament, the Constitutional Court, independent institutions and agencies, are successfully held by women. We have also increasingly adopted gender mainstreaming in our national policies. We've had a rather positive experience with gender responsive budgeting at both national and local government levels. And we also believe in the weapon in the women, peace and security agenda and have made the advancement of its implementation our top priority in the UN Security Council, where Albania is serving as an elected member since the 1st of January this year. Because gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, it is also a foundation for a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. Now, what about arms control and disarmament? The UN Secretary General's agenda for disarmament explicitly recognizes that the gender perspective makes for more effective arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament. Applying a gender lens provides key insights into the differential gender impacts of armed conflict and weapons on women, men, boys and girls, and allows for more sustainable, comprehensive and targeted policy solutions. And the UNSG also in his common agenda, our common agenda, offers a commitment to put women and girls at the center of security policy, promoting and increasing women's meaningful participation in arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament fora and decision-making bodies. It is important to recognize the significant work that has already been done to advance gender equality within the disarmament machinery. And I look forward to your presentations today. Gender does not equal women. Yet gender inequality disproportionately affects women and girls. From long years of work on women's rights, we know that increasing women's participation and applying the gender analysis are important approaches, but they are no magic wand. It is work in progress, always carrying a risk of stalling or backsliding, of being deemed secondary to the crisis of the day. At its core, it is about changing mindsets. And perhaps of equal importance, it is about breaking silos, like the ones between the women, peace and security and disarmament agendas. 22 years after the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 1325, it is difficult to comprehend the silence on arms control and disarmament in what is essentially a resolution about women in armed conflict. To what extent the implementation processes, including the adoption of national action plans, have rectified this shortfall is a question. The resources for meaningfully integrating women as key actors and leaders in arms control and disarmament have improved considerably in the last two decades since 1325 was adopted. At the international level, the work carried out by UNIDIR makes a difference. At least since I had the chance to look more closely at it, it did leave an impression. At the regional level, within our region, the OSCE and the UNODA Scholarship for Peace and Security Training Program on Arms Control, Disarmament and Non-Proliferation saw 123 graduates, 88% of which female, from 51 OSCE participating states and eight partners, partners for cooperation in 2022 alone. At the sub-regional level, CSAC, the Southeastern and Eastern Europe Clearinghouse for the Control of Small Arms and Light Weapons continues to support the countries of the region, including through gender analysis. And at the national level, apart from what governments do, civil society organizations remain critical for pushing forward gender mainstreaming and have proven to be valuable partners in implementing the WPS agenda. Women play myriad roles in peace and security as victim and agent. Recognizing these roles and how they adapt is important for designing the responses. 
For instance, in Albania, the Victim Assistant Unit was for a long time part of the Ministry of Defense. A man's job. Absolute professionals who worked with dedication for almost two decades. And now the focal point is a woman at the Ministry of Health and Social Protection, supporting the direct as much as the indirect victims of mines, who are mostly women and girls. It sounds very much like a women's ministry looking after women. And offer discussions about the WPS agenda take place between women. It is not ideal, but the women that we need to see at the decision making level, at policy level, at negotiating tables, have to come from somewhere. Just like the ambassadors that are requesting to update the rules of procedure of the conference on disarmament. Now, that that request meets with resistance is deeply regrettable. But also a reflection of the extremely difficult, challenging times we are living. Times where progress on women's rights is in jeopardy. And the world where a permanent member of the UN Security Council, the Russian Federation, is waging an unconscionable, brutal war of aggression against a neighbor, Ukraine, sparing no one, and casting a long shadow over disarmament as well. My final point is that in considering the role of gender in arms control and disarmament, we need data, which is not easy to come by or simple to analyze, but is essential for including inclusive and impactful action. And I hope very much that the work that you have conducted until now will be a very useful tool for all involved in arms control and disarmament, especially governments in their policy coming forward. So I look forward to your presentations and I thank you again for the opportunity to engage in this discussion. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your kind words about UNIDIR's work and also for sharing your perspectives on issues of gender equality and international security, as well as the uh, national and regional experience. Uh, you mentioned CSAC. I see we have a colleague from CSAC, Dragan, here. And thank you very much for joining. Uh, CSAC has been a wonderful partner of UNIDIR as well in uh, raising awareness and working together. Before we address the specific areas of mine action and, and uh, weapons and ammunition management, we have two slides to address some kind of background issues in arms control and disarmament. And the first one is to answer the question of how, which is a question that we get a lot from diplomats, practitioners who are interested in bringing gender perspectives into their work on arms control and disarmament. And they ask us, how can we integrate these um, policy agendas? How can we connect the dots between gender perspective, arms control and non-proliferation and disarmament? So there may be many ways to do that. Um, in this slide, we are listing the three most common that we have seen in the past couple of years. The first avenue is to promote gender equality by improving women's meaningful participation and agency in arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament fora. So here we can think about specific initiatives to increase the numerical uh, representation of women, but as well as their nominal representation in terms of, you know, the function they, they, they perform and also looking at leadership roles where women uh, remain severely underrepresented. A second avenue has been to apply a gender analysis that is to consider how gender norms shape, how weapons are seen and used in society, as well as the impacts of weapons and violence. And here we can think about provisions that uh, require states to provide gender sensitive assistance to landmine survivors, or we can also think about um, the ATT, the Arms Trade Treaty, which requires states parties to consider, uh, to perform a, a risk assessment to consider whether weapons or material being exported um, could be used to facilitate gender-based violence. And a third area is about connecting policy agendas. And this is to, uh, the way that this has been going on is to consider uh, not arms control and disarmament in, in isolation, but very much in a dialogue with other uh, multilateral agendas. For instance, the sustainable development goals, uh, we can think about SDG 5 on gender equality or SDG 16. 
Uh, we can also think about connecting arms control and disarmament with the women, peace and security agenda. As the ambassador has noted, uh, there is uh, still many silos, uh, siloed approaches. But it's increasingly at the national level, we are seeing national action plans that uh, on 1325, there are mentioning uh, issues related to weapons governance and also including indicators related to um, weapons, uh, for instance, small arms and light weapons in their national action plans. So these are three main avenues which we have seen um, being used to integrate gender perspectives in arms control and disarmament. If we can go to the next slide, I think it's also important to answer the question why. Why do we do this work? Why do we seek to bring together um, gender equality and arms control and disarmament? Well, the first point is the issue of equal rights. Um, both men and women have equal rights to participate in decision making, deliberations, implementation of all areas of work, including international security, arms control, and disarmament. In addition to that, um, having a gender lens, applying a gender lens to our work, help us understand different needs and then improve response strategies, which would then help to increase resilience and aid recovery following weapons use. Thirdly, applying a gender lens can help us to uncover associations between gender and power. It can also help us to reduce gender inequalities or at least avoid exacerbating them. It can help to improve policy coordination, maximize the use of resources and ensure that policies deliver for all and not only for just one segment of the population. And in this specific area where women have uh, been underrepresented and lagged behind in terms of participation, a gender lens allows to unlock professional opportunities for women and have a positive impact in their lives and in their communities. And this is something that we have seen, for instance, in the mine action field with the, with women working in the mining. And there are really interesting testimonies and analysis and research in this area that show um, that employment in mine action has had a positive impact in women in, in post-conflict situations. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we will start looking at uh, how gender perspectives have already been integrated in mine action and what can how can we take this forward. And it's interesting because uh, for us it's a it's a good starting point because the field of mine action has already seen a lot of progress both on the ground and at the multilateral level. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see that the Anti-Personal Mind Ban Convention, APMBC, already has a very good um, framework to sustain gender mainstreaming, which is the Oslo Action Plan. The Oslo Action Plan, which is, in, in, uh, which is valid 2020 to 2024, requires states parties to mainstream gender considerations in mine action programming, including mine risk, mine risk education and victim assistance. So when reporting on this progress, state parties must present data disaggregated by gender and age. And this is important because the collection of this type of um, data allow us to understand um, who is getting access to these services. And at the same time, what are the barriers that are preventing survivors, persons with disabilities, and indirect victims from accessing this type of services. And in addition to the Oslo Action Plan, the fourth review conference of the APMBC in 2019 adopted an innovative decision when it amended the working methods of the Convention's committees. Since then, each of the five committees have appointed a focal point to provide advice on gender mainstreaming. So this has been going on, I think, for the past uh, couple of years. It may be a bit soon to try to fully grasp uh, and assess the impact of this type of provision. But if anyone in the audience also has experience uh, engaging uh, with gender focal points in the APMBC, 
but also in other conventions in arms control, we'd be happy to to hear and 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 get your perspectives as well, because this is a new development in the field. And since the APMBC states parties took that decision in 2019, that has happened also in the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the CCM. And it has also happened in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW. So we are seeing distinct conventions appointing gender focal points. And uh, we would like to know, you know, what what works well and what doesn't work in this in this area. If we can go to the next slide, uh, we would also like to highlight some of the synergies between mine action and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And we are saying mine action, but also IED related work. And again, this is an, in a dialogue with the discussions here in Geneva. In July, uh, UNIDIR was asked by the coordinators of the AP2, Amended Protocol 2 uh, meeting of experts, which was uh, France and Colombia, to present on the synergies between the WPS agenda and IED related work. So we think this now may be a good opportunity to do some sort of a recap of that discussion, seeing that uh, the CCW uh, high contracting parties are meeting again in Geneva in November. So the Women, Peace and Security agenda, it has four main pillars, participation, prevention, protection, and relief and recovery. And all of those pillars are of relevance to work related to mine action and to work related to IEDs. For instance, the first one, the participation of women and their employment in different roles is transformative and contribute to women's economic and political empowerment. Additionally, the ban on the use of landmines and the destruction of their stockpiles contribute to the prevention and protection from armed violence, which is a goal of the WPS agenda as well. Gender and diversity sensitive education to the risks of landmines contributes to preventing injuries and saving lives. Victim assistance and advocacy for rights of survivors help to combat the high level of sexual and gender based violence we see in conflict and post conflict situations. And finally, clearance and handover of land previously contaminated by landmines can redress gender imbalance and empower women in the community, contributing to relief and recovery efforts, um, which are part of the uh, Women, Peace and Security agenda. If we move to the uh, next slide, we also would like to present some ideas for areas for action that can be taken in the context of the APMBC and the CCW, especially uh, AP2. The first one is to ensure the full and meaningful participation of women, as well as the inclusion of more diverse voices in multilateral meetings, such as survivors and their representative organizations. On this point, we can, we can highlight that this already is happening in the APMBC, where survivors and representative organizations have had a very uh, prominent role but in addition to that, in the APMBC, we also see good practices related to youth participation. There are, is the program of Youth Mine Action fa Fellows. Um, at UNIDI, we had the opportunity to engage with a representative from Lebanon, from the Youth Mine Action uh, Fellows earlier this year during a, a side event we did. Um, and this is very good practice as well to have allow a uh, younger generation to participate in this fora too. A second area for action is to support mechanism for disaggregated data collection related to the patterns of landmine and IED casualties and the needs of survivors. This can enhance um, this can you know enhance our knowledge about gender and risk and also our knowledge about how to deliver better assistance to survivors. A third area is to include mine action and IED threats in WPS national action plans. And a fourth area is what we said already before, uh, to support the work of gender focal points, to ensure that they have the resources, the political will, and the conditions to perform their work and you know, help states parties to, to mainstream gender considerations uh, in this uh, fora. With this, I would like to close the segment on mine action and hand over to my colleague, Hannah Salama, who will talk to us about gender and weapons and ammunition management.
Thank you, Renata, for the overview, and thank you, Ambassador, for your um, your remarks and your kind support of Unidir's work. Um, as Renata said, I will be presenting on the area of gender uh, and weapons and ammunition management, and specifically sharing um, some of the data that Unidir has collected over the years about women's participation in, um, in this area of work. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. As, as we mentioned, um, UNIDIR has been doing research for a number of years now on women's participation in arms control and disarmament. So both in, in diplomacy and at, uh, at a normative level and also at a technical implementation level. Um, so in 2019, we produced a report called Still Behind the Curve, which looked at women's participation across uh, arms control and disarmament for us, so not limited to conventional arms only, but uh, different types of weapons as well uh, and discussions. And this uh, report found that um, around on average 30% um, of delegations uh, to these foras are women. And this decreases actually once uh, it becomes heads of delegations. Uh, and uh, we see that only 20% of um, heads of delegations are women. Uh, now, we had a closer look um, in the conventional arms field and particularly in terms of uh, technical implementation roles in weapons and ammunition management. So here, I um, this relates to the uh, mine action discussion. We're talking about roles such as um, explosive ordnance, dispe um, disposal specialists, um, ammunition technical officers, and also roles in uh, the area of physical um, stockpile and security management, or PSSM. Um, first of all, um, as the ambassador mentioned, it's very difficult to have data on women's participation in the field of arms control in general, but even more in terms of technical roles. So what we did is uh, we did a kind of uh, mixed methods. Uh, we looked at data and reviewed data from um, WAM-related trainings, uh, and we also interviewed over 40 professionals um, in the field of WAM. So in terms of the WAM-related trainings, uh, when we looked at specifically technical trainings, we saw that women constituted less than 12% of participants. Uh, so there's really um, a severe underrepresentation in terms of technical roles. Um, when we interviewed WAM professionals, we found that women still face institutional barriers um, to enter these roles. They also sometimes face harmful stereotypes and even discrimination. Um, and this is really because uh, these roles have a long history of uh, being kind of filled by uh, people from the security sector, which is the military um, and law enforcement. And, um, the, and I think in the region, we all know, and, and globally, uh, these are historically male-dominated institutions. Uh, but there, there has been some, some work, uh, especially um, in the region that I'm aware of, um, on, on reforming um, these institutions or at least reviewing their policies uh, and practices to, to encourage more um, women's participation. Um, next slide, please. So again, I think it's important to look at why gender matters, particularly for technical roles, because we often get the question, you know, this is a technical role. If you're appropriately trained, uh, you know, being a man or a woman has no bearing on you carrying out the role. And yes, this is true. Um, however, we also have, um, we take, you know, Unidir takes a rights-based approach. So um, it's, it's really a question of men and women having the right to implement decision uh, in arms control and disarmament process. Uh, but also, uh, we looked at research uh, from mine action and from different fields, which showed that um, diversity and gender balance workforce will um, is, are likely to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of WAM. So this uh, was basically drawn from a couple of studies in the mine action field, which shows that um, gender diverse teams versus single sex teams uh, were more were safer and more efficient at clearing um, land and in terms of mine action. Uh, so 
this can easily be transposed to the field of WAM. Uh, and as well, when interviewing professionals in this field, they did agree that the field was uh, very, uh, or had an overrepresentation of, of males, particularly from, uh, you know, certain countries. And they, they felt that um, diversity would improve the work by ensuring that the differentiated needs of men, women, girls, and boys were also considered. Um, and then the final point, again, um, which Renata touched upon, is this um, uh, improving access for women to jobs that they previously didn't have access to. And this is particularly important in the post-conflict uh, scenario where already uh, the economic situation um, is probably very bad and um, opening up these jobs for women has the potential to transform the, um, not only for them personally, so they can take care of their family and, and, and send their children to school, but also uh, at the community level where really their perception changes from being sort of passive victims to active um, members of the community who are um, active in the post-conflict uh, phase. Um, so next slide, please. So our research found um, a couple of interesting things when it comes to, you know, how can we do this? How, what can be done to improve women's participation in technical roles? Um, and we've identified that broadly there are three actors uh, where uh, that can improve so, sort of uh, their policies or to which these recommendations are directed. So first are member states, of course. Uh, second is international organization, and the third is civil society or international um, organization. Uh, sorry, international NGOs which are specialized in supporting um, member states with their weapons and ammunition management. Um, so, I think, you know, as a starting point, what we can do uh, for all three actors is to support women's professional networks in one technical roles. Um, and this really has a, a huge potential and we've seen this in other fields, such as policing or peacekeeping. Um, and it really benefits uh, the women individually, but also in terms of career development. And this is actually one of the recommendations that has been taken on uh, by the Office of Disarmament Affairs, which is this week in Geneva inaugurating a new network for women ammunition technical officers. And I see Dragan noting because uh, I'm very excited to meet Tamara at this um, um, workshop who was one of the women working in WAM technical roles that I interviewed. So um, it's it's a very small world, but hopefully about to be bigger with uh, this network and amplifying the voices of women um, in these roles. Then for states, um, you know, as I had said, um, already lots of work has been being done in the region to adjust national legislation and policies to promote gender parity within national security institutions, um, but also for states to fund um, WAM training and opportunities that are conditional on women's participation and also fund uh, initiatives which can address the barrier to entry for women in this field. Um, another important idea and recommendation that has come out of the research um, is this idea of training civilians in WAM roles. So right now it's not a field that is limited to people who uh, have military background and increase, increasing these opportunities for training, I think can fast track women's participation um, in these roles and in these fields. And obviously there's a lot more that we can do and uh, you can see some of these ideas in um, our blog which uh, my colleague kindly shared in the chat it's called eight ways to support women's participation um, in wham roles but in addition to what i presented and the blog i'm really looking forward to um, further discussing more ideas and more best practices on how to uh, generally increase women's participation in these male dominated fields um, and this will come, this is, brings me to the end of my role here, but I will pass it on to Erica, who will speak about the multilateral process for through life ammunition management. Over to you, Erica. Thank you very much, Hannah. 
and thank you all for joining us today at, uh, to continue our presentation. So I will be continuing with an overview of the conventional ammunition process and the group of governmental experts on ammunition stockpiles and surplus and sharing a few ideas uh, for further considering gender in this process. And to, to start off, uh, so the GGE was first convened in 2008 to address the potential threats posed by surplus conventional ammunition stockpiles. And to start off in 2008, the GGE did not consider gender mainstreaming as a large part of its work compared to, to other conventional uh, arms processes mentioned earlier. And some have suggested that uh, this is particularly due to ammunition being more technical and a very male dominated uh, field as highlighted uh, by Hannah's findings as well. And um, some of the, these barriers to women's participation in this area also include uh, institutional barriers and having this area being dominated by uh, Ministry of Defense participation. And so uh, despite the, these challenges, the work of the GGE in the early 2000s led to a second group of governmental experts uh, starting its work in 2020. And the composition of this group reached gender parity, which was a, a substantial step forward. And the group included more regional diversity and greater di uh, diversity in the views of member states. And so this uh, reaching gender parity set an important benchmark for the effective participation in women. And it suggested that there are sufficient numbers of women who have expertise in ammunition management and that gender balance can be ensured uh, in the delegations uh, in, the, in this process. And so over time, the GGE progressively focused on promoting a holistic approach to address uh, ammunition throughout the full life cycle, looking at production all the way to disposal and destruction. And this approach is also known as through life management of ammunition. And promoting this holistic approach uh, provoked increasing uh, diversity in the types of actors. For example, we saw the process uh, moving beyond uh, traditional national security institution participation and this, this focus had um, a positive implication for women's participation. And we saw over time that the, the process has incorporated more gender perspectives into the debates. So in 2020, the GGE had a thematic focus on gender mainstreaming in policy and practice. And this, this focus was recognized in a General Assembly resolution which encouraged the full involvement of both women and men in ammunition management policy and practice. And so the GGE uh, concluded its work in September 2021 with a consensus report, and this led to the establishment of the open-ended working group. And so far, the OEWG has had two substantive sessions this year. The third session will take place in February to, of 2023 and will continue its work uh, to, to elaborate a set of political commitments as a global framework on through life management of ammunition. And so one important development that the open-ended working group has had is in integrating gender analysis into the debates and for example, the second substantive session in August of 2020 called to further consider gender perspectives and implications with respect to through life ammunition management. And we saw in this session also many states called for the exchange of best practice and called for the development of guidance on how gender dimensions can be integrated into ammunition management. So on the next slide, we have a few areas for action, uh, which we can suggest. Uh, so starting with the multilateral and regional levels, we've seen 
a growing body of evidence that documents the gendered impacts of both uh, small arms and light weapons and their ammunition. And we can encourage um, a greater consideration of these impacts in, in both WAM and ammunition management. And diverted small arms and light weapons and ammunition can be can have a, a serious impact on human rights violations, including sexual and gender based violence and domestic violence. And beyond uh, these physical uh, and more uh, security threats, we can also see uh, longer term impacts on uh, public health and environmental consequences, which can all be taken into account. And another area for action can be to incorporate gender provisions into WAM processes, uh, including with the open ended working group. And the sharing of national good practice and expertise on gender mainstreaming and WAM can also be uh, very useful. At the multilateral level, we can also encourage the further identification of synergies between international frameworks and regional frameworks on gender and WAM. And we can also identify complementarities between uh, WAM and their support to sustainable development and other frameworks related to gender equality. And so moving to the national level, we can also um, encourage the greater collection of disaggregated data on the impacts of small arms and light weapons and ammunition as mentioned uh, before. And we can also encourage states to, to ensure that the expertise on the documented impacts of unplanned explosions at ammunition sites are, are considered in, within planning decisions and that uh, the impacts looking at all stakeholders, including women, men, boys and girls are fully considered. And lastly, a uh, state should encourage and ensure that the full, equal, meaningful and impactful participation of women is considered in the design, implementation and monitoring of WAM at all levels. And this can include ensuring that both men and women are equally represented and also that staff with gender expertise are involved in the various functional roles and through life management. And so all of these measures can support more sustainable decisions and policies in both WAM and in the conventional ammunition management process. And we look forward to also hearing from you uh, on these ideas and to hear your national uh, perspectives on these topics. And I'll hand, hand back to Renata and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you very much, Hannah, for walking us through uh, the issues related to gender and weapons and ammunition management. As Erica has said, um, we are seeing greater emphasis on issues of gender in the OEWG on ammunition. Um, the past session saw a um, group statement by states parties on the importance of gender in, the, in that process. And we also saw a working paper uh, which UNIDIR was among the co-authors, so we encourage you to continue to follow and, and, and engage with that work as well. So here, uh, to conclude, we have some discussion questions that we prepared that we thought would be interesting to uh, share with you. But if you have other questions uh, or comments or would like you know, to share your perspectives, uh, you're welcome to. So here, uh, for instance, things that we thought would be interesting to discuss, what are some good practices on integrating gender perspectives um, from your region, from your national context? What are the opportunities and the challenges you see? Uh, going back to the issue of gender focal points in multilateral conventions, what is needed to ensure they can fully realize their mandates? The next slide also has some questions. Um, if we can go to that, what is needed to effectively deliver age and gender sensitive assistance to survivors? What are good practices with regards to women's meaningful participation in WAM or in broader uh, security sector that you have seen in your region? And last but not least, what kind of research and further evidence would be useful 
in the field of gender and conventional arms control that you think, you know, perhaps that's something that you need or could pursue as a research institute. We're always open to your suggestions and, you, and, you know, we're always looking to be of help and of, and that our work is, is of use. Uh, but yeah, I think we already spoke too much. Uh, we'd be interested in, in hearing from the people in the, in the call. Uh, would anyone like to take the floor? Uh, you can raise your virtual hand. You can raise your real hand. You can type the name in the chat. Uh, yeah, just let us know. Yes, Dragon, I was hoping you would take the floor because we know that you and CSAC have so much experience in this area. So, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Renata. I hope you can hear me. Yes, great. Uh, Your Excellency, dear uh, United Colleagues, it's really a great pleasure to be uh, here with you today uh, and to have uh, uh, and to uh, see basically that this uh, body of knowledge on uh, both women's participation, but also on integrated gender perspective in small arms control is constantly growing. And it's also that it's also providing uh, sort of the guidelines for, for all of us practitioners in the field uh, in which direction should we go. Uh, so I would really like to uh, congratulate to uh, for the United team for engaging in such a research. And uh, as we at, at CSAC are also involved in many research, uh, I am fully aware how it can be challenging to uh, get the data or to, uh, to, to, to have a dialogue with, uh, with uh, institutions and all of those who would be alike to, uh, to have on board. Uh, I would like very briefly to share something that we see that uh, as a potentially good practice. So basically, what we see that it's working within the context of the uh, of the uh, Southeast uh, Europe. Uh, our uh, approach to uh, mainstreaming gender and small arms control is basically uh, built on the four uh, interconnected uh, uh, pillars. So, uh, first of all, we are working uh, very uh, intensely with institutions on their capacity building. And in that regard, uh, for instance, we have been implementing gender, gender coach program for heads of small arms and light weapons uh, commission. And uh, uh, the gender coach program uh, uh, really proved to, uh, to prove its uh, transformatory potential here uh, in the region, because basically we are engaging in this informal one-on-one -on -one, uh, learning sessions with, uh, with the high-level decision makers, which would be uh, otherwise very challenging to, to, to have them participate in the two days uh, training or so on. Uh, we, uh, uh, with, with this uh, with gender coaching program, we are basically uh, trying not only to increase the knowledge of uh, high-level uh, decision makers uh, on gender equality within the context of small arms control, but we are also uh, 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 actually looking for ways how to enable them to act as agent of uh, change and to, to initiate the, the, the change within uh, their uh, org organization. Uh, I would uh, really like to have that, uh, that uh, implementation of gender coach program in Albania have been particularly uh, successful and we have been uh, we implemented uh, this program with uh, both previous and the uh, current head of uh, small arms uh, uh, commission, both of them are deputy minister in the Ministry of uh, Interior, and they have provided uh, great uh, support uh, uh, really to uh, implement all the uh, international, but also uh, national uh, commitments. Uh, then uh, our, uh, the next pillar of our work is uh, clearly related to uh, gender analysis uh, and data collection, and I would I can just uh, fully agree with uh, all, with all what was uh, already said uh, on on this issue. And uh, our experience shows that basically that having uh, data and full fledged gender analysis that is really crucial to make a case for mainstreaming gender in uh, small arms uh, control. Uh, uh, related to this, we are also working on increasing the participation of uh, women uh, in uh, small arms control, uh, which is uh, uh, in practice can be very challenging given the, 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 the male dominated nature of uh, small arms uh, uh, 
uh, control uh, institutions, but uh, we see that as a result of all these capacity building institutions uh, of gender coach program, gender analysis and data collections, uh, we see that basically all this is contributing to one uh, in environment which is then a more enabling to uh, women's uh, uh, participation uh, in small arms control uh, than uh, it was the uh, than it was the case uh, in the in the, in the past. We also see that uh, over the years that uh, that women uh, participation uh, is on increase, but uh, still we would uh, really like to, to see that 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 uh, that, uh, that it, it is increasing on a, a faster pace than uh, than uh, it is now. And uh, last but not least, uh, we are very engaged in. Uh, raising uh, awareness on uh, mainstreaming gender in uh, small arms control and the linkages between uh, gender and small arms. And uh, in that regard, uh, we have implemented several campaigns, particularly focusing on links between uh, uh, small arms, uh, uh, misuse of small arms and uh, gender-based violence, violence against women, but also we are trying to uh, to address uh, links between masculinity, masculine norms and, uh, and, uh, and firearms. Uh, in Southeast Europe, uh, all these activities have uh, really led to the change of the, the, the policy landscape. And in 2018, the uh, uh, regional Latin Balkans roadmap for sustainable small arms uh, control uh, was uh, adopted. And the roadmap envisaged a specific goal, uh, which calls for uh, governments in the region to fully integrate the gender perspective and ensure meaningful participation of women and uh, small arms uh, control. And uh, in all jurisdictions in the Western uh, Balkans, uh, the, the roadmap was op operationalized through uh, action plans. And we see that uh, these action plans, that uh, they uh, contain a quite comprehensive set of measures uh, to integrate the gender perspective in small arms uh, control, starting from uh, increasing participation of uh, women, increasing the availability of data, combating the misuse of firearms in domestic violence, but we also see some emerging efforts to uh, to decouple the link between men masculinities uh, and uh, and uh, and firearms. Uh, in terms of challenges, uh, I believe that the main challenges uh, uh, is related to the next steps. So what what we are what to do once when we have changes uh, at the policy and the uh, a legal level, and uh, we see that institutions are often struggling how to oper operationalize these political uh, commitments. And we are now uh, supporting uh, 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 institutions uh, really to ensure that they walk the talk and that all these uh, provisions in, in national uh, strategies and legislations are being uh, are being implemented. But also in doing so, we uh, really would like to uh, to to demonstrate in a convincing way what is the value added of uh, of uh, gender main uh, streaming in terms of challenges and that was already uh, mentioned by ambassador but i also uh, yeah i fully agree that one of the main challenges is how to ensure that uh, gender stays high on the agenda because we very often have very conflicting, uh, uh, there are very conflicting uh, priorities. Uh, and also we see that uh, uh, the, the, the challenges, uh, that new challenges are emerging. And some of them uh, were like uh, impossible to conceive just like uh, uh, several uh, years ago, but we see now that we have uh, war in Europe, which is then shaping the whole security uh, the security, security landscape. So I believe that that, that also then uh, affects uh, 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 our uh, our work. And the last uh, uh, for uh, uh, there was a uh, question about uh, unity uh, support. I believe that it's uh, that you should really like uh, continue uh, keep on your uh, good work. And uh, uh, for us. Uh, Coming from this specific region is really great to see your work uh, and your your efforts to map what are the good uh, practices uh, in uh, in integrating gender in uh, small arms control, but not only small arms control uh, and in mine uh, action. So I think that that's something that uh, it is 
very important for all of us because it provides us sort of a roadmap for uh, some uh, future uh, uh, future uh, actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dragon, for this very comprehensive overview of the work that CISAC is doing and the challenges and all suggestions for, for uh, what the next steps. Uh, we're very pleased to, to um, collaborate with you and your team on all issues related to gender mainstreaming in arms control. I would like to give the floor to our um, final speaker, uh, Dr. Cecil Lapto. Uh, the Deputy Director of UNIDIR, who will be delivering opening remarks, uh, closing remarks. Sorry, Cecile, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Renata. And thank you very much to all of you, with particular thanks to Ambassador Lishi. Thank you so much for participating in this event, um, de de delivering what were really insightful opening remarks and, and also staying for the conversation and, and all of your inputs. We really appreciate this um, and look forward to, to working further with you on, on these um, issues related to gender disarmament and arms control as well more generally. Um, as, as we heard from the discussion so far, um, and, and as we know, gendered approaches are already changing the way we think, the way conventional arms control is being implemented and, and even the way states are negotiating um, in the areas of, of disarmament and arms control. There is today a growing awareness about the relationship between gender and access to training, as well as, as between gender and decision making in disarmament. So we have a better understanding of how gender shape, um, how gendered roles shape engagement with weapons and the relevance of a gender lens in assistance program delivered to survivors. I think it's also um, really important and, and wonderful to see that at the multilateral level, we have more of a people-centered, gendered approach that is being increasingly adopted and reflected in working papers, in resolutions, in various outcome documents in the areas of arm control, arms control and disarmament. Just to just to mention, um, you know, the last year in 2021, all of the outcome documents that were adopted in the main conventional arms processes included issues related to gender. That was the anti-personal uh, mine bind convention, the arms trade treaty, the conventional cluster munition, the program of action on small arms and light weapons. So we, we really see progress. And alongside, we also see increasing calls for harmonization of national policies on weapons and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which was really discussed earlier. Um, there, are, there is support for a more equal, full and effective participation of women in all decision making and implementation processes. We've seen that state parties, and that's particularly true in, in the region, have taken innovative approaches to strengthen gender mainstreaming uh, by engaging with informal gender working groups or appointing gender focal points um, under different conventions. Uh, the example of the Cluster Munition Convention is, is a good one, uh, the mine conventions as well, or anti-mine. anti, anti uh, mine. But, you know, even if we look at all of these really important developments, much more, clearly much more remains to be done. And, and especially to overcome the long-standing gender imbalance and, and to transform the stereotypes that, that we have that underpin the field, and in particular, the, associate, the association that is too often made between technical expertise in these areas and masculinity. Um, it is in this vein that at UNIDIR, um, thanks to the great colleague, the, the great work being done by colleagues um, such as Renata, Hannah, Manavet, who is here, um, and, and also, of course, um, you know, the, the, the colleagues such as also um, uh, Erika and, and, and those working on conventional weapons, We've tried to do a number of things. We are um, trying to collect the good practices that are being implemented to promote gender equality in conventional arms control. Just to give a few examples, we've been collecting gender disaggregated data and supporting research on gender impact of weapons, offering gender trainings and coaching programs, making women uh, professional visible in communication strategy and in the media, and, and visibility is important and also engaging men in gender equality programs, which we also see as very important. And that's just to mention a few examples. 
Above all, we are really trying to have more and more practitioners realize that arms control efforts will be strengthened and more effective with more women being included. And that's also true for people of different backgrounds and career tracks. The message is, in fact, very clear. A more diverse arms control field is a stronger field. But it's still going to take quite a bit of efforts to create a level playing field. We at UNIDIR remain very committed to continue developing this work, exploring avenues that can improve women's participation and increase diversity across the full spectrum of areas of arms control and disarmament, including mine action and weapons, weapons and ammunition management one. So we hope that this briefing is in fact only the beginning of a longer journey. We really invite you to um, of course, follow our work, but also to please reach out if you'd like to propose research partnerships or ideas for collaboration, and, and we really greatly value that. And as I'm mindful of the time, I'd like to conclude, but not without um, a few thanks. First and foremost, thanking you again, Ambassador, for delivering um, those opening remarks and, and being here with us and accompanying us. Thank you so much. I'd like to also thank all um, uh, our donors, those that are providing um, specific um, funding for the gender and disarmament, but also the donors that provide on earmarked funding to UNIDIR. And also to um, thank all of you participants. Thank you so much. And last but not least, also colleagues. Thank you, the UNIDIR agenda team, for all of the work. Thank you so much. And with this, I think we can consider this meeting closed, but this is only the beginning of a longer conversation. Thank you again, and goodbye. Thank you. Excellent meeting. Thank you very well much. Done.